Can you hear me again? Awesome. So, here's a demo that shows if the problem is quite year, just using the first order gradient descent, maybe have some problem go to the optimal solution. But if you use the second gradient or second uh, gradient, then you have a much better direction. But Newton method is quite expensive because each time you need to compute the, the whole second order gradient. This is, if you have D number of features, store that Hessian gradient needs quadratic of the feature numbers. And doing the inverse of the Hessian matrix times the first gradient is even more expensive. So it's only used for if you have a really s small number of features. That is a good idea. To solve that problem, one information, one idea is that because the Hessian only used as a norm to normalize the gradient, to normalize the first order gradient. So why not just, just use approximate Hessian matrix? So this is what called BFGS. The basic idea is that using the past first order gradient to approximate the inverse of the Hessian. So, so that you only need to compute the gradient. But on this idea, it's still maybe expensive given that if you have billions of features. One billion of features using about eight gigabytes of data. So even store all the past gradient generally is not a good idea. A simple fix is that because each time you search point one by one, one by one, and you only care about the current hissing of the current point. So if the, point, the gradient for the old positions maybe helps little for the kind of things. So the basic idea that, sorry. So the basic idea is that you can drop the very old gradient just to keep the rest of the ones. So LBFGS means you only keep the rest of maybe 10 or five gradient, use that 10 or five to approximate the second order gradient. And yet this is a very standard algorithm, so works very well even that the object function is not convex. So let's go to the second method. That is a gradient descent. This is also a very ancient algorithm. So the basic idea is that if for a very high dimensional problem, maybe it's quite difficult to solve this problem at the same time. So why not each time we solve a small problem at the, for one time? So each time we pick up one feature and fix all the weight, all the values for the rest of the features so that we get a one-dimensional problem. On this time, for this small problem, I can solve by some expensive method, such as Newton method. Then next time, I fix another, I pick up another feature, fix the rest of it, and continue to the, do one, one by one. So this algorithm works very well for sparse data because each time you only pick up one feature and do not care about all the other things. You only update this one feature. So it doesn't matter if it's dense or if it's sparse because you do not affect each other and you do not care about how, odd, how sparse and dense the other things are. So LibreNear uses this algorithm and it has been shown a lot of data set. It works great. But the problem is that it's a sequential method. You update feature one by one. Each feature may be quite small. So I think the day before yesterday, we show a date, we show some sparse matrix. A lot of features only contains one or two non-zero entries. That means each time you only update, do one or two operations. So it's not a good idea to run a multi-thread things within one feature. And if you want to have a distributed implementation, it's not desirable because each time you only compute one, communicate one double value. So you need to pay the delays between sending data between machines. It's about 500 times than reading us data from memory. So, but because it's a fast algorithm, so people think about how to run on the multi-thread, how to run distributed version. The short term is a very simple idea that 
if you have n thread, why not just using that each thread update one feature? So if you have n thread, you update your n features at the same time. This works well if the feature is not very correlated. For example, for the sparse da data, maybe because you only have a few long zero ranges. So maybe very two very sparse features do not correlate each other too much. So it's quite safe to update them in parallel. So on theory, we can show that if the Lambo thread choose to be the Lambo feature divided by the maximum eigenvalue of the covariance, ma covariance matrix. So it's, it's, then it's okay. So if the feature is not so related, that means the covariance matrix may be quite like a identity matrix. This means this number goes to one. So you can update all this feature at the same time. But on the, another extreme case, all the features are the same. On this case, in this case, this number goes to about the number of features you have. So you can only use one thread. You should update one by one. So, and this, thread, this problem, may, this algorithm maybe have problem that because now you, you, you update a few coordinates at the same time, but one coordinate, one feature may be too small so that you need to pay the task function call and the thread synchronizations. So you have a, if you have a very large number of small features, then this method maybe have some overhead problem. Another idea is that, okay, so how about we solve a block of feature at a time? So that means a block maybe contains about millions of features if the problem is really large. So in this case, for example, we can first pick up a block of features and read this feature, read this data, and update the variance of the model. So next, we solve another block. So if it's done, we move to another block. Mm, I think block coordinate descent is much easier than the sequential block of block code, uh, sequential code in descent. If you want to run multi-thread, you can read, run it block, just like as what we did for the gradient descent before. And if you want to have a distributed implementation, you can just uh, view as, okay, for the current block, I just think, okay, we, the problem only have so many features, so we just run the distributed implementation as we did for the gradient descent. So given if the block is sufficiently large, so, so the thread overhead, the communication overhead, maybe it's good enough. This, this algorithm works well if the features within this block are not very correlated. So you can update them at the same time. But it maybe have problem if the features are really correlated. So you need to decrease the learning rate to guarantee the convergence. As we said yesterday, if we run if we run a standard distributed gradient descent, it's not so efficient because we sequentially use the CPU and the IOs. So we mentioned yesterday that we can use asynchronous updating to pr pr to let these both resources work at the same time. So here's an example. This is one machine and one row is a block. So for each block, we first compute the gradient. The gradient. Then we push the gradient to a remote machine, for example, the server or the rank zero machines. Then if, if that machine connect all this local gradient, update the model, then this machine will get the updated model from that machine. The computation use some CPU powers, but push and pull are just use network. So if we want to maximize the utility of the CPU things, you can do not wait that things, the network finish. You can move to the next, uh, compute the next block immediately so that the CPU are keep, keeping busy. And at the same time, the network is training something. So next, you can move to another block. On this case, you have problem, definitely, because 
on this block, you have two weight block, two are not in consistency. So instead, comparing to the sequential algorithm, this you start with this block, and you didn't get the update from previous to back. This should be fine if two blocks are not very right correlated. But you maybe have some problems. That's, so this is called eventual consistency because we do not guarantee everything. But if I give you enough time, all the machines, all the data should be consistent because at this time, all the things are, are done. But before that, we cannot guarantee everything. So if you really care about the data inconsistency, inconsist you can have a maybe, maybe a, a more slightly strict version. That is, you bound the de delay you can allow. That is, before we start block two, we can allow block one is inconsistent, it's okay. But we should guarantee block zero is done. So we only allow only one block is inconsistent. Inconsistent, sorry. And so in this case, you wait this block zero to be finished. Okay, so this time you can reduce the number of data is not consistent, but you place you on this time you need to wait on this stage. So the CPU is not doing anything here. How to analysis this relax the consistent model? Intuitively there's three things matters. One is that how feature related within a block. Okay. The second is how two sequential updated block are related. The third is that, okay, how many delays are you allowed? Given three number, we can choose the learning rate, which is one divided by the variance between within a block, the variance between block times the maximum delay you can have. So if you want, so if both are quite related and you allow a much of delay, so you need to have a very small learning rate so that you can converge. So if you want to have a larger learning rate, one possible solution is that you can make the feature on the block are not so related because you partition the feature on the block and you can choose how to partition the things so that the feature within the block is not so related. The second thing is that you choose the order how to update the block. Now you can choose the proper order so that two sequential block is not so related. So you can improve these two numbers. And also you can have a zero delays. That means you waste some, some system performance, but you gain a faster converge rate. So this is a trade-off I will show you how to tune that things and how it behaviors. So before we go to the experiments, let's first show how to implement these things. In the primary server, there's two communication APIs. One is that you can push a range of data to the server. The second is that you can pull a range of data from the server. So in this case, you can push a, a block of gradient to the server after after server get the gradient, update the model, and then you pull out the block of the weight back. And if we want to tell the system how to control the consistent model, we make a we make a represent uh, we make a concept here. It is a ta task. A task is a push or a pull. It is related to several machines. You can push something out, pull something back, and also any user defined function. For example, one iteration. A scheduler maybe schedule, send a task to all these work machines. Okay, let's start iteration one. And so given a task, now you can define some dependency between tasks. A dependency means, for example, this is maybe this is iteration zero, iteration one, iteration two. So this is a dependency means iteration one should be wait, start until iteration zero has been finished. This is means, okay, I should wait iteration one be finished. So on this model is a sequential model. This is what we discussed yesterday. And on this case, there's nothing here. So both that can be started at the same time. 
So this is eventual consistency. We do not guarantee everything, but if given enough time, everything should be good. Um, this is the slightly restricted delayed model. So you are now, you are, for the task two or iteration two, you are now, once not finished, you hand off parallelization here, but you cannot wait, you cannot delay too large. So you should wait zero, iteration zero to be finished. So, and this is a concept. How do we implement the things? In fact, it's quite easier. So this is a very simple, this is the actual code we have run. This code runs on the scheduler. This is a process. The scheduler issues the task to all these workers. So this is a for loop. The first loop says, OK, let's pass the data one, ones and twos. The, the inner loop says, each time we update one block, we choose the block, we create a task, we set the waiting time. This is the current time. This is the delay you can ha have. So that means this task can be started if the, the task with this time stamp have been finished. So next, I tell you what the task it is. Next, and tell, okay, this is, this tells you what the task it is, you update the model, and this I tells you what is the feature range this block it is. So I submit to a, to a, to a pool. This pool, mean, this pool have all those work motions here. So if you submit something, this pool, the system will send all the tasks over network to all these machines. So the, ma the machines get this task we are do updating. And I, re I return the time to you, so this is a time associated with this task. The scheduler can wait on this time, but you can also continu continue to do something else. Okay. So this is the scheduler program. So you can have, uh, you can have maybe complex uh, things here. You can do non-social, do, do things unite. Okay, so this is experimentation. Okay, let's go to the experiments. The experiments we use that, we use sparse logic regression. So this is a regret, a logic loss plus a penalty. This is a sparse regret, it's L, L1 norm. So why L1 norm is important? Because if you have a lot of features, the L1 norm will automatically set a feature for you so that you can reduce the impact you can reduce not so large model. It's, it's quite easy to deploy to the online services. The data set we use is, is a come, from, come from computational ads. We have discussed this application two days ago. So we have 170 billion of examples. It's about, I think it's several months log. Then we have, given this sample, we generate about 65 billion of examples. So you have a lot of feature groups, work and grants, sessions, compilations, so you have so many data. The raw text data is about 600 terabytes. So yeah, it takes a while to read the data to, some, to the training machines. We use 1,000 of machines to run the experiments. So each machine have two CPU cores. Each core have about eight cores. So you, uh, two CPU, each CPU have eight cores, so you, you get about 60,000 of cores. We compare two algorithms. Once we have discussed LBFGS, so we extend LBFGS to solve the L1 regressor. The next is a block called and descent. This both system, commercial system, is well optimized and it takes a lot of codes. So one is about 10,000. Another is about 30,000 lines of code. And both algorithms run a sequential algorithm. So this is what like we have discussed yesterday. So for the gradient descent, each one get a gradient, update the model, and broadcast the things. So this is sequential model for a block gradient descent. For each block, you compute a gradient, you aggregate a gradient, and then you update the model. So on this model, we use a bounded delay. So we can choose how many delay we have, and another, Filter here that is like a, what what LibSVN as a LibLinear also do that. If the current feature the weight is zero, and I predict that 
it should be remain zero for this iteration. So if it's true, I can ignore the feature. I do not compute the gradient and do not send it. So if the problem is really sparse, it saves some, it saves some computation and it also saves some communication things. So we show, first show the objective value versus time. The x-axis is the CPU time, and the y-axis is the object value. So here's the two. First, look at the LBFJS. It converge slowly at the beginning because you have a large object value, but it converge very fast at the at the past. So this is quite related to Newton method. That means if the if you go to near the optimal solution, you converge quadratically fast. But if you if you far away, you look like oh, just like gradient descent. So for the block gradient descent, you converge fast at the beginning, also at the end. So given the same object function, you use about half time as the LBFJS. The red line is on the, almost the same algorithm, but you have a relaxed, uh, consistent model. So you, have, you even save something. So how do we get that? We can show the reason here. So here's the reason. We show how many times you are spending on the computation, and how many times you are waiting the network, waiting something. So for the LBFJS, about 30% of time is only waiting. So I think it's a reasonable number, because each iteration you send gigabyte of data and receive gigabyte of data. So it takes some while. The next is the quadrant descent. This number goes to more than 50%. Why? Because for each block, you have a global synchronization. You need, you need all this machine have been done, and all the grading have been sent, and all the grading have been, all the model have been received. So you have a lot of, a large number of synchronization, global synchronization, than LBFJS. So you, if you have one pro, 100 block, so you, you use about 100 times more synchronizations than LBFJS. BFGS. So this time, you, you, you should wait more. But this number can be reduced dramatically if we use a relaxed, relaxed things. So because during synchronization, you are, wait, you are doing some computations. But you pay a cost, because this is a computation, and you slightly change the number of computation you pay, because the relaxed model you convert slightly slowly than the sequential model. So to shift the same object function, you need a little bit more times. But this is worse because you use about half time as the, this guy. So you given about 600 terabyte of data, 1,000 1, machines, you can train the model V train a batch model within one hour. So I think, okay, this is, for the batch learning, I think this is the best that we can have. For the online thing, the things are different. So maybe we can cover tomorrow. Oh. Okay, so let's show some demo how to run these algorithms on the real, on the cluster set up by Zico yesterday. Something goes wrong. Okay, I think we should use watch.
Okay, because we have enough time, let's start from scratch. So you first go to find the link. And you choose XLarge. And you can start a machine. Okay, so the first step, check what the version you have. Oops. Sorry. Okay, it's good enough. Get more. Second one, check what the editor you have. Oops. Never mind, I'm not VIN user, I'm Emacs user. Okay, good. So next, you copy your configuration to this machine. Everything's good. Next, you start the cluster. So you first generate a new token. I think this, yeah. And using the script, write by Zico. Now you can check what the machine you have. It takes some time. Next step, go. Oh. You put the new version here. Okay. Okay, you change something. You slow the local change for something. And make, use multi-thread make. 
Okay, something goes wrong here. Ah, uh, because, okay. Because this is not the standard install installation. So instead of changing the makefile, I just link to a, okay, because Oops, why? Sorry, I don't know why <laughs> this guy's never mind. So because this is I put on this directory. So Dico didn't put the things on standard way, so instead of changing make file, I can just link the things. Okay, you can make it again. Okay, it takes some while because the multi thread is not enabled. I don't know. Maybe some problem here. So there's the binary, there's something on the binary here. The next step is that because you only compile the things on this local machine. All these other machines do not get the right binary. For the MPI job, you need to put you need you need to make all this all these machines almost look the same. At least you have the binary for each machine. The next step is to send all this binary to all these machines. They could have a right, have a right, nice synchronization classes script. We just call it. Okay, it's quite slow because you synchronize the you synchronize all the this huge directory. So you can delete this one. If you do not install the things on the system program, you just synchronize the home. That's enough. So next.
Mm. Okay, use the flight to the better things. We have already sent a large, slightly large data set to these machines. This is about one gigabyte of data. And if we want more, I have more on this laptop. So I still want to figure out a way how to send maybe more than 10, 10 or gigabyte to the server. So we first use this small data. It's about four millions of examples to show today. And let's go to the configuration. So what we want to use is this one. So here, it's quite similar to what we used for the gradient descent yesterday. The only difference is that we use the L1 regressor here. So this is tells you we use L1 penalty. And this is a coefficient, the lambda, the lambda here, this point zero, a point one. And so this is another things how tells you how to block cut the blocks. So this number means for each feature group, I first communicate, first account the average long zero entries each row you have. So get the average number times four, then we cut each feature group to that number. So if it goes to one, it's like so you would you want like each instance only have one, at most of one non-zero entry for one block. So if it's true, that means this feature group, all the features are not related. But because it's not likely happens each time, so you use a slightly larger number, so you use a more number of groups, number of blocks, but you guarantee that the feature on that block is not so correlated. The next thing is quite simple. And this is the maximum delay you can have. So we first use a zero. The last thing, you may be not near to care about it. So because we do not use line search here, instead we use a trusted region method. So instead, you test you each time how, how large the region I can do search. I guarantee that each time do not change too much because of the bad gradient or some bad values. OK. So now you can do. For the NPR run, you first uh, test tells you the host of file is it's on here. Decode put the host of file here. You can have a look at this file. So this is all this machine you have. And you test NPR run. Host the fire, and you can show. Okay, you have eight machines. Oh, so yeah, this is almost the same. So the next step usually you want to have check is that all this thing, all these machines get the same binary file. You can do that by using. OK, so that means all the machines get the same file. So now we can start running. But before you start running, you should look at what is the network you have. So this is the local, this is the local IP you have. If you run on a single machine, that one is good. In this case, the real machine, the real IP machine is here. It's a virtual Ethernet a string name. So you should tell me how can which IP I should choose for this interface. So next you tell me how many servers you want, how many works you want. 
maybe eight, because you have eight machines. Each server, how many threads you want? Because it's four core machine, you use maybe use eight. And now you test me which application you want to run. It's so because you have two servers, sorry, two servers, eight workers, and the one scheduler. You had that, so you should create at mo at least um, thirteen process. So even that you only have eight machine, you can create more than eight process. So some process maybe have the same machines. So you can have a larger number. So it's fine. Okay. Something. Okay, I I tell you. I didn't get that. IP address because I forgot to tell you the interface. Virtual Ethernet. Okay. So now you start read data. Each one we are read the block of the data. So next, next because you on this data set you have about 100 feature groups. Now you use a four times four, you get about 300 blocks. This is a training object function. You have one iteration relative object function. This is because you use one L1 alone here. So you have sparsity here. And this is a filter you have. You how to filter in not active features. And the last one, maybe you can ignore the first two colon. The last one is that how many time you use the for one iteration. It's measured by the schedule, schedule of load. So that be an accurate number. So as you can see, each iteration uses about 12 seconds. So I can kill this job. So try another configuration. The first you want to try that, do not use a sequential. So this is not. Do not use a sequential. Consistent model. You can use a slightly large one. For example, one delays. Let's try it again. Okay, even use one delays, you can reduce the time from 20 to 40. 14. Next, you reduce about four seconds. This is reasonable because you have paralyzed the CPU and the sound network. The thing you want to care about is that how many you time, how many converges you lose for the relaxer things. As you can be see, this is 6.2, this is zero, and this is 6.23. So it's slightly change increase the number of effect function and. This one, and you can see this is always slightly larger than the coding iteration you have. But, okay, let's go a larger. For them, use 10 here. Okay, this time, this number goes to even larger compared to it. But you save some, you use half of time as the sequential model. And this goes to five, five. So on this model, using a large delay, you save about half of the times. But yeah, you increase the object function. This is iteration three. 5.4, it's actually 4, 5.2, as compared to the sequential model. Okay, I didn't, three. Okay, this is using three, four iteration go to 4.9 here. And you didn't go to 4.9 yet, but this guy is okay. See, 4.9, on the same iteration and use slightly 
less than than the previous one. So, if the delay is not the proper delay, you can, sometimes you can win. If you use a very large delay, maybe it's not the case because you have almost used your CPU power, but you, the converge rate is quite slow. So the delays are trade-off between system performance and the converge rate. And it really depends on how many the feature correlated for your data, how the network you have, and how the system behaviors. So in practice, on logistic regression, we find that maybe a delay about around five. For the largest experiments, we use eight for the delay. is the most uh, proper one. So comparing to the running time versus object function. For, the, for, an, for another application, for example, LDA, maybe you can use a very, very large learning rate, large delays. Even uh, eventual consistent model is good enough. And the next thing maybe I want to show is that you can decrease the number of blocks you have to reduce the synchronization cost. But maybe you maybe make the things, the features on the block quite related, so that maybe enhance your performance. For example, I can use one block. No, I'm just using a slightly better delay model. So you decrease the number of the parameters, you have slightly more blocks. And on the previous one, you're using about 14 seconds from one iteration. So you decrease the number of blocks, and you save a lot of sometimes. But maybe it's not a win. On this case, it's fine. Because, yeah, on here, you get 6.2. And here, you get 6.4. So you decrease the number of blocks and make the feature more correlated, maybe affect your converge rate. So this is also another trade-off. OK, so I think today we discussed how to compare to the gradient descent. We discussed how to do LBFGS, Newton method, and the gradient descent. The most important thing is that how to distribute the gradient descent. And we show some demo. I think if you run a sparse learning method, lasso, or SVN, or logic regression, the gradient descent is really a good choice. And, but if you run some, another application, for, for example, deep learning, maybe you want to try some mini batch. Maybe I, we are not cover mini batch SGD on this lecture. And so this is all. Thanks. Any questions? Oh, this one. I didn't print the things. Uh, if we finish, I can show how many things you have. For example, I can show you. So in fact, this is. These two columns measure the minimal working, the worker, how many times the worker spend on, compu on local computations. This is the minimal number, this is the maximum, but I think there's some, some problem measure the times. Maybe it's a bug problem. Because I do not use standard, I think I do not use standard GCC things. Maybe it has worked, it works well on Mac, but it's not working so amazing on Linux. So if it's fake, this bug, you can see, this is almost the, the local commutation time. This is the total time. You minus it, you get the number of communication you have. And I can show you how many things you have been communicated. This is maybe a very huge number for very large data. But this data is not so large. So this number is not so very big. OK.